environmental issues that are facing uh, Canada now and to help us develop what we should be uh, working on, what should be the advocacy agenda of CCLA for the next few years. As you go back to your respective provinces, my hope is that you will have a sense of seeing what are the emerging issues that we should start right away uh, evaluating, looking at, uh, studying, and, and paying attention to. Alors aujourd'hui, évidemment, euh, le programme est chargé, mais c'est un programme particulièrement extraordinaire parce que tous les, euh, les, euh, les personnes qui ont été invitées à participer euh, ont accepté notre invitation. The, what you will hear today are really uh, uh, la crème de la crème uh, of, the, of the, the human rights lawyers uh, in Canada. And, and human rights advocates uh, in Canada, I am pleased to say that everyone that we asked to come and speak to you uh, says yes. So we're very delighted that I think it shows how important how the legal profession generally and how the advocacy center uh, uh, value uh, the fact that you are there to carry the torch. And I think it's a testament to the strength of the profession and of the advocacy sector that we want to ensure that indeed you continue to do the good work. Alors, euh, ça me fait grand plaisir, évidemment, de présenter notre premier euh, conférencier d'honneur, euh, le juge euh, Gouge de la Cour d'appel de l'Ontario. Justice Gouge is uh, one of uh, uh, the keen mind and the big heart uh, of uh, Canadian legal landscape and has been uh, doing this all his life. He was a leader of the profession before he joined the bench and since then, he's been really one of the driving force uh, at the Ontario Court of Appeal. He has an honors BA uh, from U of T, a master's uh, from London School of Economics, a LLB from U of T as well. He was called to the bar. I'm avoiding uh, mentioning the dates. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the last uh, century. <laughs> uh, he was Queen's Counsel. He was managing partner at this firm that's now Galing Henderson. Uh, he, where he did a practice that involved him in front of all tribunals and, uh, and the Supreme Court as well. He lectured at University of Toronto. He was uh, uh, counsel to the office of the Premier of Ontario in 1989. He was active for the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, for the Ontario Bar. He was a bencher of the Law Society. He, he is now a, a member of the Board of Governors of the Law Commission of Ontario. And certainly, I think, I cannot thank him enough uh, for agreeing to come uh, on a Saturday morning like this to celebrate uh, human rights and civil liberties. <laughs> Let's see. Well, thanks, Natalie. Uh, it's a delight to, to be here. It really is. I mean, you guys are the future of the profession and the future of the defense of civil liberties in Canada. I, I, it's really... Uh, sort of inspiring for me to see you here from all over the country. Um, I'm going to talk for a bit, uh, not the full 50 minutes, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, I have this daunting prepared text in front of me that uh, I confess is perhaps a touch recycled, but I, th I, thought, I thought what I would do is just uh, talk for some time about a core message I would like actually to try to leave with you. And, and then, um, as I said to Natalie, I'd be delighted just to engage in a dialogue, conversation with you, questions and answers, and uh, uh, about anything that uh, you, you think it might be fun to talk about in connection with advocacy, civil liberties, the courts, judging, and so on. So let's just play it by ear and, and, and see how we come along. But let me, let me just start by, by uh, yeah, the, the core idea I want to talk about uh, uh, stemmed from my looking at the program. I mean, it's a great program. Uh, the speakers, as Natalie's already said, the speakers you're going to hear from are leaders of the bar, leaders of the civil liberties movement in Canada. Uh, their subjects look fascinating, and goodness knows they're enormously important, increasingly so in today's world. Um, it sort of set me to thinking, and with the assistance of my law clerk, Matt Law, who's here this morning, about the history of those who have acted before you doing this kind of work throughout the years for the Civil Liberties Association. 
Um, for me, they rank among the real heroes of, of the law. Um, uh, in many ways, the work they do defending civil liberties represents the highest ideals of our profession. And that's really what I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, the link, it, and, and this is my, my sort of thesis, the link between defending civil liberties and what I would describe as the fundamental values that must guide lawyers in order to truly proclaim that they belong to a profession, the legal profession. In other words, you know, how the work of the, the CCLA exemplifies the values, how the values call lawyers to the important task of defending the civil liberties of all of us. And when I started to think about that, uh, my first thoughts were really kind of anecdotal and centered on this roster of illustrious predecessors that have gone down this path before you. Um, I could easily start with Natalie and the person that she succeeded, Alan Borovoy, both of them icons in, in uh, the justice system, both of them paragons of uh, the civil liberties movement. Neither of them uh, want me to do that, I know, without even talking to them. But they represent the best we've got to offer. But looking back over the years, um, Matt and I went back over the cases that the CCLA has participated in in the development of jurisprudence generally, but obviously particularly civil liberties jurisprudence over the years. And it's an astonishing Hall of Fame. It, it really is. Um, Eddie Greenspan in Morgenthaler, Abortion Rights and the Defense of Necessity. In, he did Ross and New Brunswick School Board, uh, teacher disciplined for anti-Semitic statements and freedom of religion. In Sharkawi, Constitutionality of Security Certificates. Uh, my mentor, a, a hero for me in the practice of law, Ian Scott, who became the Attorney General of the province in a case called Dowson, the right of the Attorney General to stay a private information. Uh, Ian did a good deal of civil work, civil liberties work, much of which I, I, I was honored to inherit. Mark Rosenberg, my colleague Justice Rosenberg in Keekstra, the willful promotion of hatred and freedom of expression. Zundel, the sp spreading of false news and freedom of expression. For you people closer to law school than I am, these are all familiar names, and you can see the magnitude of, of the issues that the CCLA has been instrumental in formulating in Canadian legal history. John B. Laskin in Tremblay and Dig, a father's right to enjoy them, enjoying the mother's right to an abortion. Sheila Block in Regina and Butler, obscenity and freedom of expression. Patricia Jackson in Adler, the funding of religious schools and freedom of religion. In Mills, the right of privacy to medical records. My colleague Bob Sharp in Hill and Scientology, the common law and defamation and charter values. Neil Finkelstein in Ramsden and the city of Peterborough, putting up posters in violation of municipal bylaws and free speech. Kent Roach, who will be here today and and uh, it did absolutely superb work for me in, in an inquiry that, that I did into pediatric forensic pathology. In Stillman, the admission of evidence obtained in violation of charter rights. In Latimer, mandatory minimum sentences and cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, closer to today, Jonathan Lysis, one of today's truly leading litigators in Clayton case that I sat on in our court and then went to the Supreme Court about the police power to establish roadblocks and unlawful search and seizure uh, in, in a case that I know is very close to my kids' hearts, R versus AM, that's the random search of high school students' backpacks and unlawful search and seizure. And if you don't think high school kids have a sense of civil liberties about what's in their backpack, you should come to my house. Um, Chris Brett in R versus Man, the power to stop and search an unlawful detention. Andrew Loken in R versus Nazagualak, the availability of sentence reduction as a remedy for charter violations. Frank Adario in R versus Golden, strip searches and unlawful arrests. An enormous litany of cases that we all know, we have all read, they have all been important in formulating uh, the defense of civil liberties in Canada and the CCLA has been instrumental in all of them. It's an extraordinary list. Um, what, do, what, does, what 
these lawyers and the kind of work that, that they did in those cases, would we know make us proud to call ourselves members of the legal profession. We know intuitively that this mosaic created by these examples wonderfully reflects the fundamental values that, that, uh, of good lawyering. So I, I began to say, why, why is that? Why does the defense of civil, civil liberties so wonderfully capture what we think about when we think of what is best about lawyering? The kinds of norms that we want to guide our profession to make us the best we can be. Why is there this close connection? Well, you could start by saying, why is law a profession at all? Well, a lot of that's historical. It, it goes back to... Uh, the Middle Ages, when law is always, like, like uh, medicine and divinity, has always been thought of as a, quote, profession. But behind that lies a certain reality. From the beginning, lawyers have been seen as having a special learning and, and knowledge. As a consequence, they're asked to perform services essential to the individual and the collective welfare of the state. Um, they're regarded as exercising this special responsibility, and given the power and the authority to do it because in large part they are seen and accepted as being guided by a shared set of norms and fundamental ideals. And for me it's those ideals that are in large measure what uh, the answer to the question what does it mean for all of us to say as, as you will continue to do throughout your careers and as I have for all too many years now, how do I answer the question what does it mean to say I'm a professional? Uh, for me, it has come to mean very much that I see professional life, hopefully the life I can lead, as being guided by these ideals. They're not reflected in every activity the lawyers do, goodness knows. Uh, it would be utopia if that would be the case. But in large part, they're like all ideals. They're aspirational. They set the goals that lawyers must aspire to, to be the best they can be. Um, and the core of those values uh, goes back a long way, but it remains only the core. You will all know the fundamental conception of lawyering that Lord Brougham uh, began with. That is the paradigm of the zealous advocate, where there is one duty and one duty alone, and that is to the client at all costs. That, I think, in today's world is a narrow view of all that's encompassed by professionalism. It is much more than that. Uh, a more modern conception takes into account other fundamental ideals, uh, like serving the public interest by advancing fundamental values, the values of the Charter, for example, equality, free speech, religious freedom, and so on. Professor Trevor Farrow at, at Osgood has done some wonderful work in articulating this much more modern vision of professionalism that I think much more fully captures what we'd like to think of as the ideals that must guide us as we go forward. Um, however we describe them, the ideals have to take account of profound contextual changes that have, have occurred in the practice of law. Um, over the years, uh, laws become increasingly a big business at some cost, I think, to professionalism larger and larger firms, ever more vigorous competition, and so on. Um, it's also become more global. It's become more complex. It's, the makeup has, has uh, been much, become much more diverse, thankfully, reflecting the society we serve. Uh, it's no longer simply, uh, as it was, I confess, when I began, the preserve of, of uh, uh, white males from the same social uh, background. Technology's had a profound impact. So there's no doubt that a number of contextual factors have come together and do have an effect on the kinds of values that uh, we see at, uh, at, the, at the core of, a, of our profession. Um, it's hard then to uh, know how to fully articulate uh, the modern conception of professionalism. Uh, I was part of an undertaking that attempted to do that at uh, the turn of this century, only 10 years ago, um, there was a significant sense amongst members of the profession, the judiciary, and the academy uh, around that time that professional values were being diminished in importance to what they ought to be, perhaps what they can be. 
and um, my boss at the time, Chief Justice McMurtry, and my now colleague, Bob Armstrong, who was then the treasurer of the Law Society, formed a committee called the Chief Justice's Advisory Committee on Professionalism, made up of leaders of the bench, the bar, and the academy, uh, whose objective was to promote professional values, to articulate them more fully, and to try to ensure that there was some counterbalance to the various contextual forces that were perhaps tending to minimize the impact that they were able to have on young people practicing law. I think it's been widely successful. Let me tell you how it approached the question of trying to articulate what the fundamental values were um, or are. Um, the committee began by essentially viewing these ideals as a set of qualities and personal characteristics to which lawyers must aspire to if they are going to become the best they can be. And let me just offer a few, uh, because I think in the offering you will see, f for me, how it becomes clear that the work that those I described did, the work that you people will do in the future, manifests a number of those ideals and goes a long way to explaining why it is when we look at these cases and these leading members of the profession, we say to the, ourselves in that context, that's the very best we have to offer as a profession. I think it is because to some extent they reflect these fundamental characteristics to which I, I think uh, these ideals point us. Uh, excellence in leader, legal scholarship is clearly a part of that vision. I mean, from the beginning, the profession ha has been considered a profession, as I said, precisely because of uh, its members having acquired knowledge that others do not have. Um, th there is something, as all of you know, uh, that rings true about thinking like a lawyer. There is some notion that seems to be captured by that phrase. Uh, Anthony Cromman, who, who was a former dean of the Yale Law School, uh, wrote about it this way. He said, thinking like a lawyer means, broadly speaking, to be attentive to the facts and to know which ones in any given situation are important, to be able to tell a story with the facts, to master the power of nar narration, to recognize what others hope to achieve, even or especially when they have a hard time defining their own ambition, and to appreciate emphatically a range of human purposes and values and ideals wider than one's own. But lawyers must not only, it seems to me, think like lawyers, they must learn the discipline of the law and have the skills necessary to apply that knowledge. Uh, because as law grows more complex, this challenge grows more difficult. Uh, so that the continued excellence in the pursuit of scholarship allows lawyers to continue to serve as they must uh, in, in, in the service of the public. A second quality, it seems to me, that uh, the committee articulated and that rings true for me is that the best lawyers exemplify, live integrity. So much of what lawyers called on, are called on to do depends on it. Um, uh, one's personal integrity is called into play on a daily basis, as all of you, even in the early years of practice, are beginning to realize. Um, the aphorism that's often attributed to Abraham Lincoln, that a lawyer's word is his or her bond, remains a vital objective for the good lawyer. But there's more than that, it seems to me, about that there's more than just personal integrity at stake. Uh, lawyers m must share a collective responsibility that the legal profession as a whole must discharge. Uh, and a significant uh, aspect of that is to ensure that all lawyers act with integrity if the legal profession is to fulfill what it must do. Um, in that context, the defense of civil liberties has the unshakable integrity that comes from being founded on principle. Then there's independence. Uh, that's a matter of the legal profession, but I think it deserves a little unpacking. Uh, it's no more, nowhere more demonstrated or more centrally important than in the work of defending civil liberties. Um, uh, 
a key feature of independence uh, is the fundamental it, uh, ideals it, uh, ideal it represents for the profession as a whole and how it must work. Um, it encompasses a high degree of aut autonomy for the profession from other sources. Only that allows the profession to do its work within the administration of justice. Uh, David Scott, who's a, an eminent litigator from Ottawa, the, the, the chair of BLG, uh, described it this way in a way that, that fully describes the kind of work uh, defending uh, civil liberties that uh, is exemplified by the cases I referred to. He said, the bar is independent of the state and all its influences. It's an institutional safeguard lying between the ordinary citizen and the power of government. The right to counsel, which is interrelated with the law of privilege, depends for its efficacy on independence. In order to fulfill the heavy responsibilities imposed on lawyers in this, in this important task, a meaningful and practical environment of independence is essential. Nowhere could that be more true than in the defense of civil liberties, which after all is exactly about that. Now, a characteristic that is also a part of this panoply of, of ideals is, is civility. Uh, I'm not going to dwell long on that. It doesn't simply mean an absence of forceful advocacy, quite the reverse. It does mean a respect for those opposed in view and for those uh, in, in the other parts of the system. Uh, one need only imagine how the cases were argued by those whose names I read out to know that the defense of civil liberties in those cases could not have been done without more civility, with more civility. Um, so uh, going, going beyond that, um, a characteristic that is perhaps less often articulated is that of leadership. Um, lawyers have always been seen historically as leaders. Uh, their ability to muster facts, their ability to coalesce reasoned argument, uh, their position in organizations and society generally have necessarily meant that they assume positions of leadership. Uh, it can be by providing clients with advice through the difficult maze of the legal system, but it's also by speaking out to address systemic injustice and protect the core values of society. Uh, the lawyer's skills are particularly attuned to play that role in society, and the characteristic of leadership that it exemplifies is part, I think, of the ideals of our profession. All of the people whose names I read to you earlier uh, personify that quality in significant measure. Uh, the, the former justice of, of the Supreme Court, Louis Brandeis, uh, said in a speech almost 100 years ago now, the lawyer's training fits him especially to grapple with the questions that are presented in a democracy. Uh, that's exactly what the work of the CCLA seeks to engage. Uh, nobody has lived that ideal over the last 50 years more than Natalie's predecessor, Alan Borovoy. Um, then there is the notion that perhaps is the most difficult to fully describe, and that is that lawyers must uh, aspire to achieve a balance between the law as business and the law as profession. There is a dichotomy to there, there to some degree. Uh, law does represent a way of making an income, often a very good income, but it must at its core remain primarily, at least in my view, a profession. Um, the best lawyer is dedicated to serving the public but also is dedicated to having income and status though worthy, not as primary goals. In 1953, Roscoe Pound, who was then dean of the McGill of the Harvard Law School, 
um, has this wonderful description uh, of what it means to be a member of the legal profession. He said this, the term refers to a group pursuing a learned art as a common calling in the spirit of public service. No less a public service because it may incidentally be a means of earning a livelihood. The pursuit of the learned art in the spirit of a public service is the primary purpose. And again, nothing exemplifies that more than the work you're going to be discussing this morning. Um, so if those are seen as expressions of some of the fundamental ideals, for me essentially the core fundamental ideals of the legal profession, um, we perhaps should articulate why it is that they actually matter and promotion and understanding of them matter and doing work to which they call us matters. Well, for me, obviously, the rule of law depends on it. The successful resolution of individual legal disputes requires that lawyers manifest these characteristics so far as they can. Sound legal scholarship, acting with integrity, exercising independent judgment, exemplifying civility, they all contribute to the smooth functioning of the justice system. Uh, the improvement of the system also depends on it. If we're going to continue to change our justice system to adapt to the, the modern necessities of society, to deliver the fair and just outcomes that people now require and expect, lawyers have to continue to aspire to these goals. Um, to take uh, but one relevant example, uh, the protection of civil liberties that is necessary for the rule of law to be maintained will only be achieved if lawyers are true to their fundamental ideals and make it happen. It can also be said that lawyers have to continue to pursue these ideals if, if the public is to have confidence uh, in the system of justice itself. The public expects that these values will inform our work. Um, lawyers perform services that are essential for the proper functioning of society. They make the system function. They occupy significant positions of leadership. In return, they're accorded a certain stature and prestige in society just because of the expectation that they will bring to their tasks the values and attitudes that are expected to be exemplified by lawyers at their best. And if we fall significantly short of that, uh, it's at significant cost to public confidence uh, in the justice system. And uh, another aphorism that for me captures what's at the heart of that assertion was, was formed by Wendell Phillips, who was a great American lawyer and abolitionist. And he once said, law is nothing unless behind, close behind it, stands a warm, living public opinion. In other words, without the confidence of the public, the justice system lacks its fundamental foundation. Part of maintaining that foundation depends on lawyers doing the kind of work that manifests the sorts of ideals I've tried to talk about. A final reason for maintaining the importance of the, these ideals, I think, is sort of centered on, on lawyers themselves, um, particularly <laughs> young people like you. Um, all of us, or at least many of us, went to law school because we want to make a difference. We want to belong to an honorable profession. It's not just job satisfaction, it's personal fulfillment. Um, and unless these ideals provide guidance uh, in a very strong and directing way for the profession, we will not be able to offer to young people the kind of career enticements that are necessary to get into the profession, folks like you. So I think there is a significant self-interest in the legal profession in trying to live up to these ideals so far as it is possible. Um, how do we do that? Well, focusing on professionalism, on the nature of these ideals, uh, what they mean for us and how to promote them uh, has not always been front and center for the legal profession. Um, historically, so far as there were values passed from generation to generation, uh, they were far more uh, 
uh, the product of, if I can put it this way, breeding than act, uh, positive education. Um, uh, there were certain rules promulgated fr from the early days, but in very large measure through, through uh, the first probable, probably century of the life of the Law Society of Upper Canada, uh, norms were formed as much by codes of gentility as by books of rules. Um, that started to change in the early part of the 20th century as the fundamental ideals uh, came to be seen as rather more than simply uh, uh, offspring of the social culture from which lawyers came. Law societies began to set out more thou shalt nots. Uh, they also over the years adopted more of what I would call the aspirational dimension of professionalism that I've tried to describe the Canadian Bar Association, other organizations, uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the Legal Academy. Um, the Legal Academy has been relatively slow to get into this, although in the last 15 years, great strides have been made. Uh, those of you who've been to law school in Canada over the last 10 years may well have had the opportunity to be exposed to courses that are devoted to professionalism. Uh, before that, uh, there was very little, if any. Uh, there is now a young cadre of academics across the country that is engaging in this as part of their academic pursuit. Uh, for people of my vintage, that's thrilling. That ensures that, that uh, the guys who come behind you are gonna come out of law school having had at least an opportunity to start to grapple at a far earlier stage than I did with the question, what does it, what does it mean uh, to be a professional? It was not always thus. There's a great quote I want to read you from Rosie Abella about the time she was at law school and, uh, and what the attitude was to the formal teaching uh, of professional ethics back then. Here's what she had to say. When I graduated from law school, no one taught eth ethics or professionalism. In the bar admission course, the then Chief Justice of the province gave a simple one-hour lecture on how lawyers should behave. He told the over 500 students never to wear brown suits and white socks, a largely irrelevant observation for the 10 women in the room <laughs> who nonetheless shared the Chief Justice's view of brown suits. <laughs> so, I mean, that sort of, with Rosie's typical insight and wit, uh, captures where legal education was in in the 60s and 70s. That that has all changed. Um, I, I want to sort of uh, uh, end by talking about uh, the role of organizations and this organization in particular, the Civil Liberties Association, because uh, it is clear from the history of the organization, its work doing the cases that I recited its educational work, its communications work, its holding of meetings like today, that organizations, uh, principally the CLA, uh, CCLA, are vital um, in, the, in, in the living out of the kinds of professional values I've described. And as we go forward, uh, I think they will have an increasingly important role to play. It's not so much explicit proselytizing about the, about the fundamental ideals I've tried to describe. It's living them. Uh, because by living them and by giving you people the opportunity to live them, uh, I hope they become contagious. I think they will. Because there is a large slice of all of us that has a deep belief in the value of this kind of work and it is, I think, in part because it does reflect what we have intuitively thought about what is the very best in the legal profession and why we want to be part of it. So I think it's wonderful you're here today. Um, I spent a lot of years practicing law and getting a lot of satisfaction out of doing this kind of work. The organization continues to thrive and to grow. Uh, and I hope you'll continue to participate in it because I think the work could not be more important for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which 
it exemplifies the very best of our profession. Thanks yes. for thanks. For I'm happy to spend uh, 15 minutes or so chatting. If any of you have any questions, or if not, we can have coffee. <laughs> you know. How recently are all you graduated? I mean, who graduated in the last five years from law school? Are you, or are you all there now? Are you all there now? From across the country? How many come from law schools where you know whether there's a course or not on professionalism? I'm just curious. See, if I'd asked this question five years ago, I probably would have got one hand. That's very interesting. And for me, that's a terrific thing. Because I think, I, I think the more explicit focus there is on this, the better off we're all going to be in the end, including, and there'll be beneficiaries, including those who want to do work like this. So, well, I'm happy, I'm happy not to take questions. Uh, I'm, no, I, <laughs> yes, question? Yeah. Uh, I would like to question. I was wondering, uh, should the life partners of MPs and senators be appointed as judges from ensuring the independence of the nation? That's a very good question. Um, Full disclosure, my wife is neither a senator nor an MP. <laughs> All right? <laughs> She's a simple lawyer, same as you guys. Um, the notion of, of legal independence is a really interesting one. I mean, my, my basic answer is I think in today's world, spouses can live different lives. Okay? That's, that's kind of my basic reaction. Um, where one draws the line, and, and, and let me just tell you about our court, because the, the notion of independence is related to the notion of conflict, okay? When does conflict of interest arise? Um, and uh, we see that daily where I work, because you've got to figure out if there's a certain conflict in a, you have a conflict in a case that you're about to hear. <coughs> the bottom line norm in our place is if you feel uncomfortable, then you shouldn't sit. But, to be candid, there are different thresholds of discomfort. I come, my, my immediate background before I became a judge was that I was the managing partner in a big firm where uh, it was absolutely essential that you ignore every possible conflict and therefore take on every possible case. <laughs> okay? Uh, so I have a very limited perception of when a conflict arises. Um, I would probably, my wife's an arbitrator. Okay, so if this example has never arisen, but let me, you know, give you give you my response to a hypothetical. If, if there were a judicial review decision of one of her cases, I think I would not sit on it. I think that, but that's self-preservation. That's that, that's that, that's, that, that has nothing to do with with any notion of principle. Okay. Um, but, you know, situations have arisen recently for us where, where judges have siblings, uh, kids who are, who are uh, you know, in law. Uh, do, you, do you sit on a case that uh, we, had th we had this just last week. Okay, I'm, I'm sitting on a case with one of my colleagues who's, whose son is at Steigman's. And uh, what do we do when a case comes along? Well, he had had nothing to do with the case. Uh, he hadn't been there all that long. And she felt comfortable sitting. I actually thought uh, she should sit. Uh, and, uh, because for me, the notion would be if the son had worked on the case, then you probably shouldn't sit. Okay? Son has not worked on the case. It seems to me it's okay. Uh, coming back to the, the, the sort of uh, the person involved in politics, um, uh, as a spouse, I'd be inclined to say that it probably would be okay to, uh, to be a judge. Um, it's interesting, though, eh? I mean, there is now, I'm sure th those of you who are American political junkies, as I am, know about this. Um, uh, Justice Thomas in the United States, his wife is a very active member of, 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 an, of a right-wing political group that is intent on over uh, throwing out the, uh, the current administration. Um, and he's going to be sitting on cases. You know, the health care legislation comes to the Supreme Court, and his wife has a very high public profile opposing the merit of that legislation. Okay? Not the merit of it as the legal merit, but, but the policy merit. 
Um, what does that do to the perception? I start to get nervous about that. Okay, I start to get nervous about that. But that has to do with a little gloss on the question you ask, which is what happens if there is a politician who is very active in a policy area that spawns a legal question before the court? And I would have thought in that circumstance my answer might well back off the spouses live different lives basic philosophy and say, I don't think in that case the judge should sit. Um, but the whole notion of independence, I mean, I could talk for a long time about that unless, you know, but it, 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 uh, it was most, a thing I've spent a lot of time on, one of my colleagues, Dennis O'Connor, and I have, have both spent uh, a good deal of time over the last few years doing, an inquiry, doing inquiries. And the notion of a judge as a commissioner raises the same related kind of notion because there you're not a judge at all, you're an emanation of the executive branch of government. You're you're essentially doing the government's work, and at what point does the government, uh, <laughs> government able to control you or not? It's not an easy question. It really is a, isn't an easy question because judges strain against having their independent judgment fettered in any way. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and so what we've done uh, is uh, we've actually drafted a protocol for the judiciary about when judges should take on inquiries and under what terms designed to protect the ability to make independent judgments. Uh, but in that context, it's obvious that the government has a clear interest in trying to you know, keep, their, keep their hands around how far the inquiry goes. Uh, no government wants a John Gomery, you know. Uh, and... and, and uh, so how do, you, how do you keep your hands around it? And from the judge's perspective, how does the judge, in fact, ensure that the judge both does what the public expects as commissioner, which is to be independent? I mean, that's the reason we're asked to do this stuff, you know, it, it, and, 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 it, and, and secondly, is able to return to the bench and to continue to have the public's confidence as somebody who is independent of government. So, you know, your question could spawn an endless discussion, something we're going to have to think more and, 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 and harder about as, as the years unfold and as judicial life gets more complicated and judges are asked to do more things that are other than, than the norm. Does the protocol uh, talk about the terms of reference? Yes, absolutely okay. does. Ab absolutely does. Uh, again, this is not saying anything, uh, telling tales out of, out of school, but... Uh, Ontario has drafted a new Public Inquiries Act. Uh, it, it, it was done, uh, I saw Kent Roach here, as he, would, he would probably say it was done in the dead of night. I can't quite articulate it that way, <laughs> uh, but he would. Uh, and, and it very much set out to provide the government with more tools to control inquiries. You know, there are legitimate government reasons for wanting to control an inquiry. You've got an inquiry that goes on for 10 years. It's going to spend a lot of money and spin its wheels. So there are, it's not a black and white debate, but it's one in which judges have as their primary goal when asked to serve as commissioners, the goal of preserving the perception of independence while they're doing the job and after they return. There are a couple of hands back there. Paul? I just had one question for you. I'm wondering, is, I think the last 10 years, been a lot of new challenges with respect to civil liberties and what I would maybe call like globalization of civil liberties, international listing regimes, uh, sharing of information uh, between states, um, or even Canadian state agents, whether it's the police or uh, spies or uh, military acting abroad. There's a lot more globalized cooperation in states, and it seems that that's having an impact on civil liberties. And I'm wondering just to what extent is um, like some of these cases are percolating up. There's not a lot, but there are a few, and, and you know, unfortunately there might be more in the future. I'm just wondering to what extent is the judiciary alive to that? Like, I know there's all kinds of a, councils and committees not speaking of any one case or another, but right. is this a topic that's coming up that, that you're speaking with your judicial colleagues? Well, like, uh, 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 again, a very perceptive question. Um, I, I'm going to link this to the immediate uh, the last occasion Natalie and I were together, which was Thursday. Thursday. <laughs> okay. Um, but it relates to your question. Let me try to describe it this way. We had a meeting on, on, on uh, all day Thursday, Wednesday evening and Thursday, with our colleagues from Quebec, okay? 
First time the two courts have ever ever met were the two biggest intermediate appellate courts in the country. A lot of us know each other personally, but as courts we had never met. So um, I'm on the, the organizing committee. So we sit down and say, what should we, what, what program should we put together? Well, we, first half of the day was nuts and bolts. How we each do our work. Slight differences, big differences, but that's mundane. You know, there are 45 people in the whole world that are interested in that subject, and they were all in that room. Uh, okay. Um, but the second half of the day, we thought it would be really um, inspirational. It would really be stimulating for all of us to get two of the wisest people we could think of to come and lead us in a discussion about big issues that are going to affect the world we judge in, okay? Big issues like globalization, like changing demography, like technology, none of it having an immediate one-step logical link to a particular case, all of it providing vitally important context for us to understand as judges if we are going to make sense of the world whose problems we are being taxed to address, okay? Natalie was one of those two. Natalie and, for those of you from Osgood, Harry Arthurs. Uh, and it was a fab. I was saying to Natalie earlier this morning, it was a fabulous afternoon. These two had us up here at 30,000 feet, you know, talking about, we all kind of know issues of globalization and have a sense that they impact on our world and the world we're attempting to address in our cases. Um, but, you know, Harry and Natalie were both very polite. They began by saying, this is the first time I know any court's ever done something like this, you know. And it's true, I think. I mean, I've been a judge 15 years and, and you know, we have some issues. Some We have an education committee that's actually pretty good about bringing us issues at that order of magnitude. It's vitally important that the judicially maintain its awareness of those broad social changes, absolutely vital. How we do it is another question. I mean, one thing that goes with this job is there are, there are clear institutional, it's not really a, 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 a occurrence that force you in that direction, it's almost inertia, uh, that, 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 that tend to promote isolation, you know. And, and we're all aware of that being a, a, an occupational hazard because th that's the last thing we need if we're going to be effective. Absolutely the last thing. So we attempt to fight it, but it's a, it's a crucial question. You say to me, precisely how are we going about trying to get a better understanding of globalization, how it affects international interchange of information, that sort of thing? Uh, we haven't addressed that with that level of precision yet, but that order of magnitude, that kind of subject, is exactly the kind of thing that we spent uh, Thursday afternoon trying to talk about. There was a student, uh, you had your hands up, or there was a student with the hands up. Yes, yes. Um, I was interested a little bit, uh, you mentioned the, the change from to being a white male dominated profession to a more diverse profession, especially now that most um, entering at least 50% of you know. Um, I wonder if you could speak to some of the ways that that may have impacted professionalism and the profession You guys ask very good <laughs> and very <laughs> tough questions. Um, uh, I, I think it's impacted it in a, in a whole lot of ways. Uh, I mean, the, the main way it's impacted the profession for me is, is, is the wonderful value of, of, of uh, uh, being more representative of the uh, of, uh, the society that we service. Um, we, uh, I'm going to tell Russell's story. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to show you that it's not just limited to the profession, but also applies precisely to the judiciary. I mean, we're pretty white male. We had a, jo we had a joint picture taken, all right? <laughs> we had a joint picture taken at lunch uh, on Thursday. And the whole of us in the front row, I mean, we're old white men, you know? <laughs> That's just the way of, of, of the appointment process. There is growing diversity in the bench, but it's slow, okay? Uh, it's not as fast as law school because law school is being able to grow from the young end up, eh? Uh, and it'll happen. 
Um, but we talked. We were taxed to talk about <laughs> our, our two leaders ab 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 about the uh, representational deficit, okay? Um, and one of my college, uh, colleagues is Indo-Canadian, okay? And he gets up spontaneously, Justice Juriance, and speaks about the value that he sees to have come from he was speaking of his, this in, in, his, in the context of when he was a trial judge, uh, being able uh, to actually have a better comprehension of what those of the same kind of cultural makeup were trying to say to him than he would have had had he not had the background he had. And uh, so he came forward and spoke. Harry LaForme, who's, who's uh, an Aboriginal Canadian, came forward and spoke. Um, but there are there are two minorities. We don't have it, you know. We got women, uh, not enough. But uh, so that that's a growing problem. You say to me, how has it affected professional values? I think it has made us more conscious about the value of diversity. I think it has made us more conscious about ideals that uh, that. Uh, uh, don't depend on ethnic or cultural background, I, I, ideals like independence. Um, it, it, it's just such a healthier profession. I mean, it really was even, you know, it's not very, you know, I'm not that old. I mean, I, I, I was called to the bar in 1970. But when I was called to the bar, I, th I think we had, out of a class of, I don't know, 150 at the U of T Law School, we probably had five women. You know, so uh, now that uh, you know, the the big breakthrough happened sort of in the mid '70s, eh? Um, and uh, but the breakthrough is so much more than gender now. I mean, it's transgendered. It's very uh, the, the, the cultural diversity is wonderful. Uh, there's a program at uh, at uh, at Osgood called the In Scott Public Internship. Uh, that provides uh, funding for kids doing NGO work in the summertime, and part of part of the deal we have is that after the summer, I have them all down for lunch at Osgood, and I had lunch yesterday with with uh, uh, five of them, uh, and the diversity in that group is is just stunningly wonderful. Okay, just stun and they they get all over the world doing this stuff. I think it'll change the nature of the profession more than anything in in my lifetime. Any other questions? If not, well, je pense que... Ah, oui, voici, voici. I don't know if you allow me to ask me in French. Oui, mais oui, oui, oui. Posez-la en français, je vais la traduire. Oui, oui. You don't have to answer any questions. Um, J'aimerais avoir votre opinion sur... Euh, vraiment, fondamentalement, vous avez parlé des, des valeurs de la profession. Est-ce que vous croyez que c'est vraiment quelque chose qui est, qui est appris ou qui est inné? Juste rapidement, est-ce que c'est -ce que est quelque chose qui s'apprend? Are they things we can learn, or do they come from our background? From your, you know, are you born with it, or, or do you learn it? <laughs> Boy, you guys ask tough questions. Um, let me tell you one of the ways we're wrestling with that. This is an avocation of mine. Okay, I actually really, I've spent a, a lot of time over the last ten years trying to focus on how we can somehow um, enhance the notion of professionalism. And it raises squarely whether you're born with it or it comes from within or whether it's somehow something that uh, can be rationally explained and therefore perhaps communicated. And I think it's a bit of both, okay? I, I, I'm not sure I've finally formulated my I, any, any, any firm thoughts on that. But we are going through right now, I mean, one of the huge issues is um, if you're going to attempt to communicate about the values of professionalism, um, uh, viewing the practice of law or your life in the law as a continuum, starting at law school but running through the profession, if one said, where is it being done most effectively now? Where is that communication taking place most effectively now? I would argue that it's at law school, okay? Because law schools have engaged this subject in a way that I think is quite wonderful. Not that it's got the full flower in the legal academy that I would love it to have. 
but it is far better than it was a decade ago. And as I said, there are young academics that are devoted to this and will ensure that it continues and I hope grows. The real challenge is not with you people. The real challenge is with the person who's been practicing 10 years, who has a fixed way of doing it, who may have abandoned any thought of a fundamental principle driving why they're practicing law, okay, and may act accordingly. What do we do with that communication gap? Well, we're going to have a workshop um, uh, sometime in the early in the new year where we're going to gather, we're going to try to gather uh, pedagogues, basically, teachers, people who can tell us how one goes about, not, not necessarily legally trained pedagogues, but, but people whose business it is to try to communicate about values, okay? Um, and to ask the question in a way that suggests the answer is very difficult and might be you're born with it is part of what we may be attempting to communicate is something about judgment. How do you teach judgment? You know? But on a, it seems to me we can't give up on this. There are, you know, just by discussing the ideals, people tend to reflect on them. So I, I don't think it's something that we simply shrug and say, you're either born with a set of ideals that is going to drive you to be the best lawyer you can be according to the ideals of, of the profession. Uh, I think it is more than that. I think there is a, a, a shared exercise of communication that will enhance the degree to which we all understand and I hope, therefore, are moved to live by these ideals. A lot of it's doing this work. So there yes, you go. Yes, please. That was great. Yes. Well, on all of the, I want to thank you. This this set us up, I think, in exactly where we should be about thinking about our engagement with the civil liberties and the profession uh, from the rest of the day. Alors, merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for coming. Okay. Thank you very much. So, uh, so I, I think without further ado, grab a coffee quickly and we'll set up uh, right away for the next, uh, the next panel. Uh, students and the speakers, if you have your expenses, if you want to just uh, uh, give them at the... Uh, Rachel Brown, who is uh, standing at the desk there, uh, so that we can uh, reimburse you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.